On behalf of the Vice Chancellor of this great university, Professor Adebayo Sinam Bamire, I stand here to present Professor Ademike Ayobola Olaogun for the 363 inaugural lecture of this university. Ademike Ayobola Olaogun, PhDRN, is a professor of maternal and child health nursing at um, the Department of Nursing Science. She had a basic nursing education at the School of Nursing, Ilori, finishing at the overall best student in May 1977. She proceeded to the University of Ibadan, Ibadan in 1979, where she earned a BSc nursing degree in 1982. As one of the three languages, she is registered with the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria as a registered nurse, registered midwife, registered public health nurse, and a uh, registered nurse tutor. She taught at the schools of nursing in Lori, Obangede, and Kenu uh, from October 1982 to September 1995, rising from the rank of nurse tutor to principal nurse tutor. She joined the Department of Nursing Science as lecturer two in October 1995 and rose to the rank of professor in 2013. Her main research trust is in maternal and child health nursing from 2009 to date, working with our colleagues and students in the department, she introduced the standardized nursing languages and standardized nursing care plan into Nigeria. Her role in the establishment of Nadai Network in Nigeria fetched her the name Mama Nadai. Professor Olaogo has contributed to four books and has over 50 published journal articles. She received many research grants and awards. She is most honored for receiving the Qatar Award for on-time graduation of two of her PAD students and the Outstanding Service Award presented to her by Nindai Nigeria Chapter for serving as pioneer uh, national president. Sure, sure, sure. Also, Ola Ogun loves nursing, teaching, and research. Our students inspire her immensely. She is happily married to Professor Matthew Ola Tokumbo, Pamidele uh, Ola Ogun, and they are blessed with children and grandchildren. Our inaugural lecture is titled the pains of womanhood, toils of early childhood, and ethos of standardized nursing languages, a compendium by a maternal and child health nurse specialist. Ladies and gentlemen, I have present Professor Adenike Ayobola Ola Ogun for our inaugural lecture. While still dark at an early hours of a Wednesday in a rural community, a young primary school teacher fell into labor without a doctor, midwife, or traditional bath attendant. She delivered herself of a baby girl. Twelve years later, the same woman died from the complications of pregnancy on another fateful midnight in a maternity hospital. Another statistics in the case of maternal mortality. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, our royal fathers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I hereby express my deep appreciation to God for giving me the privilege to deliver the 363rd inaugural lecture of this great university. First, 
from the Department of Nursing Science after Professors Jinodu, Pajemilei, and Iriyoye, and the second in this new administration. My presentation today addresses my contributions to research in maternal and child health nursing and in standardized nursing languages, my lifelong teaching experience in nursing and my community service. I grew up when the prevailing custom about female nurses was that they were women of low character, snatchers of married men and wreckers of home. Sadly, my father, thought this was true. He advocated against nursing for his daughters. Coincidentally, at a later stage in his life, he got married to a nurse. It was a big polygenous family with many children. Therefore, each child had to cater for his or her post-secondary education. To the glory of God, I finished secondary education with a very good grade. Thereafter, my elder sister, Mrs. Moji Adeleye, who was working as a clerk, decided to sponsor my post-secondary education. I proceeded to the higher school certificate program at the Queen's School in Lorry with an aim of getting my A-levels and then proceed to the university. However, a distant cousin, late Mrs. Dupe Akin Yoyemi, who was a midwife, got information that the School of Nursing in Lorry was would be commencing and had placed advertisement for admission. She got the application form on my behalf. This was to pave way for Moji to proceed to the Advanced Teachers College, Zaria. At the interview, the members of the panel asked why I wanted to study nursing with such an excellent school certificate result. I had to make a choice. So in 1973, at age 17, my journey into nursing started without informing my father. When I received my first stipend, like every good child, I decided to send the money to him. He returned the money. My father's perspective notwithstanding, I believe that I had been divinely led into nursing. These divine guidance had piloted my progress over the 49 years of being in the nursing profession. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the anecdote about the woman who died from pregnancy complication, which I presented at the beginning of this lecture, is a true life story that reflects a common experience among many Nigerian women and projects the pains of womanhood. Womanhood includes the totality of experiences that comprise the life of a woman. In Africa, the social construct of womanhood has two central defining elements, which are being a wife and being a mother. Traditionally, as a wife, a woman is responsible for taking care of the home and family. As a mother, the mother's social standing and self-worth in the community is based on her ability to bear a child. In many parts of Nigeria, these long-held beliefs and expectations about women are based on patriarchal ideologies that could seriously affect a woman's health. Ras Walk 2016 identified some of these beliefs as harmful traditional practices, namely early and forced teenage marriages, female genital mutilation slash cutting, practices which prevent women from controlling their own fertility, some preference and widowhood practices. As a nurse with a medical sociological background, some of my research emanated from the consequences of these harmful practices. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, child marriage is a formal or informal union in which one or both parties are below 18 years old. The woman at this age is biologically economically and socially not prepared for childbearing. Epidemiological reports from some northern parts of the country have revealed that 93.7% of young women whose first marriage is at 14 years end up with obstructed labor, while 83.8% end up with obstetrical fistula. In a retrospective study that we conducted on the complications and outcomes of pregnancy, at the Mohamed Muritala Hospital, Kano, as reflected in Table 1. 
In 1989, there were a total of 16,408 deliveries and 20.04% that ended with complications. While in 1990, there were 15,628 births and 20.6% had complications. In that year, there was a total of 596 cases of obstetrical fistula. The major complications were antipartum hemorrhage, eclampsia, and obstructed labor due to delays in assessing care. Obstructed labor resulted in obstetrical fistula, OF, in the women, and fetal death, sometimes necessitating embryotomy or craniotomy and maternal death. A ward and a surgical theater were assigned to OF patients in Muritala Hospital. The results of this study was my first publication before joining academia. OF is a life-altering condition that results in maternal morbidity. As illustrated in figure one, during labor, because of an obstruction, the urinary bladder anterior to the uterus or the rectum posterior to the uterus is displaced upwards. With increased rub from the presenting part, that is the fetal head, during contractions, there is reduced blood supply to the soft tissue of the bladder or the rectum. This results in necrosis of the tissue. After delivery, within the third to the tenth day, the necrosed tissue sloughs off, leaving a perforation between the vagina and the base of the bladder or the rectum. This results in continuous leakage of urine or feces from the vagina. The effects of the urinary or fecal incontinence on the women are enormous. The women become ostracized by their husbands and families. They often do not have income to live on and are excluded from social life because of the smell from the incontinence. Therefore, they suffer psychologically, socially, and economically. For over three decades, global efforts have been targeted at eliminating OF. In an ongoing project by our team, as shown in Table 2, at the same hospital, the number of OF patients receiving care at Muritala Hospital has increased within the last five years. And on the national level, the number of OF centers have also increased from three in 1990 to 19 for the management of OF. May 23rd has been designated as the International Day to End Obstetrical Fistula, hashtag End Fistula. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, after taking appointment at this university in 1995, I discovered that OF rarely occurs in southwest Nigeria. However, female genital mutilation slash cutting, FGM slash C, is a common practice. FGM slash C is a traditional harmful practice. This Asian practice cuts across different ethnic and religious groups. FGM slash C covers all the procedures that result in the partial or total cutting of the female external genitalia, which could be for cultural or any other non-therapeutic reasons. According to WHO, FGM slash C are of four types as shown in figure two. From the sexual rights perspective, FGM slash C is a major indicator of gender inequality. The re-infibulation, that is the researching of the vulvar scar done after childbirth in women with type 3 FGM is to ensure that the vulva opening is narrowed to give the husband sexual satisfaction. What a world of pain for the woman while the man gains pleasure from sex. From 1996 to 1998, I contributed to the attempt targeted at its eradication. I got a fund from the John D. and Catherine T. Makato Foundation Fund for Leadership Development. This grant was used to conduct a community-based project on the eradication of FGM slash C in five communities in Oshu State. At the pre-intervention phase, 93% of the adult women, 83% of the adolescents, and 80.7% of the female babies were already mutilated. The qualitative results revealed further that the people had heard of the campaign against FGM slash C 
but linked it with part of media activities. Sadly, with the misconception that FGM slash C reduces promiscuity, a secondary school teacher made a special plea, quote, any campaign that is aimed at female circumcision should also teach our girls how to delay getting sexually active and how to prevent pregnancies. These girls get pregnant, they commit abortions and drop out of schools. Also, look at the streets. They are there selling akara, table water, pure water, unquote. Based on the results of the plenary phase of this project, I formed a multidisciplinary team. The team developed an integrated educational program, IEP. The IEP had modules on anatomy and physiology of the sex organs, reproductive health, traditional practices including FGM C, safety, nutrition, how to study, and career talks. The team produced a video titled Atumboton, The Consequence, and composed songs. We used this to campaign against FGM C for over two years. We held group sessions with students, teachers, parents, various sections of the communities, and policymakers at state level. Over two decades after our intervention project, and with continued effort from many international and local non-governmental organizations, evidence is showing that the attitude to FGM C is changing. A subsequent project by Olaogun and Shinobade 2020 that assess practice of FGM C among mothers with infants attending primary health care center showed that out of 244 female babies whose genitalia were examined, only 40, only 16.4 percent were mutilated with either type 1 or type 2 FGC. When compared with the 80.7 percent of the babies already mutilated as found in the 1996-98 project, as shown in figure three, there is a reduction, but a continuation of the practice. Unfortunately, a new issue is arising from the continuation of the practice. This is the medicalization of the procedure, that is the performance of the procedure by healthcare providers. So for some such practice in 2000 AD, working with the Federal Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization, a training of trainers workshop was conducted in Ibadan. Learning modules on how to integrate FGM C into the nursing and midwifery curricula was pilot tested. The Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria has introduced FGM C in its midwifery curriculum. Medicalization of FGM C is now a global issue. It had been reported in some developed countries. For a better understanding of this problem, our team proposed a nursing diagnosis labeled Handicapping Beliefs to the Neander Diagnostic Committee. In the 11th edition of Neander Eye textbook, risk for female genital mutilation was included as a new nursing diagnosis. The United Nations General Assembly has designated February 6th as the International Day for Zero Tolerance for FGM C and fixed year 2030 as the global projection for its full eradication. Other factors causing pain in womenhood are cultural and religious practices that prevent women from controlling their own fertility. This could result in unintended pregnancies. Globally, the major strategy to reduce unintended pregnancies is the use of contraceptives. The rate of unintended pregnancy in a nation is a central measure of reproductive health. When our team conducted a community-based research on the determinants of unintended pregnancies among nursing mothers, data as shown in figure four show that only 11.5% of the women reported that their index pregnancy was intended. 62% were not using any contraception at the time of the study. Significant risk factors for unintended pregnancy are parity, ethnicity, and religion. Some religious groups discourage the use of modern contraceptives and emphasize that every child is a gift from God, thus preventing women from controlling their fertility. 
it is interesting to note that some women desire to terminate such pregnancies. In a nation where abortion is not legalized, such abortions could be handled by quacks, thus exposing them to infections and death. Why would a woman be subjected to such pain? Every woman should have the right to be free from pain, which includes the choice of when to get pregnant. To further compound the problem of unintended pregnancies is the issue of some preference. Some preference is tied to inheritance. We conducted a study on, among university undergraduates. 50% of them desired having a male child as a first child, as shown in figure five. Of those who desired a male child, 89% wanted between three and six children. Preference for some discourages women from using contraceptives, and such women have shorter birth interval. A potent strategy to reduce unintended pregnancy and its consequences of abortions and death rates among reproductive age women is to provide accurate information on reproductive physiology, pregnancy, and other relevant health issues. This information must be provided as early as possible during teenage years and continued into adulthood. I joined a team from Calvin University, Grand Rapids, USA, on an international multi-site, USA, Kenya, and Nigeria, educational program of two weeks health camp that runs annually for adolescent girls of ages nine to 15. The girls are educated and taught hands-on skill on general health issues, leadership, reproductive anatomy and physiology, sex, contra sex contraception, and the negative impact of smoking, alcohol, drug abuse. Currently, this project is being replicated locally in selected secondary schools in Oshun State through a grant from the Bowen University Wood. The project is targeting boys and girls, parents, teachers, and policymakers. It is anticipated that these health camps will give one appropriate knowledge and decision-making skills to teenagers that will equip them to make right decisions and to enable parents and teachers to develop skills for communication on sex issues and with the adolescents. The problems of womanhood are not only limited to cultural and traditional practices. There are pathological factors that will affect a woman based on her anatomy. A woman is characterized biologically by the breast, the mammary gland, and the uterus. There are breast cancer, BC, and cervical cancer, CC. BC is the world's most prevalent cancer and the fifth cause of death that affects women in every country and at any age. It is not transmissible like CC. Our team used the Gale mathematical model to estimate the individual's five-year absolute BC risk. The identified risk were short duration of breastfeeding and a history of BC in a first degree relation, either mothers or sisters. The GAIL model used for risk assessment revealed that only 2.3% of the respondents were at high risk of developing BC. The American Cancer Society has advocated that the women at a high risk for BC should be accurately identified so that appropriate prevention strategies can be offered. In Nigeria, breast self-examination, BSE, is a screening method that can be performed by women themselves. It is inexpensive and convenient and is therefore a good screening method that can be used on a regular basis and at any age. Furthermore, our team in another study discovered that among a segment of OAU workers, 96% had good knowledge of BC, while 75% had good knowledge of BSE. In the area of practice, 69% indicated that they practice BSE. 19% practice BSE a week after menstruation. And only 6% utilize the three patterns for searching for breast lump. That is, the vertical strip, wedge pattern, 
and circular pattern in performing the BSE. These results reveal that there may not be an early detection of BC by the few women that are at high risk. We recommended that intensive education be given to girls and women on BC and BSE. Based on this, cancer awareness was incorporated into the health educational packages developed in our program. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women. About 90% of all new cases and deaths that are caused by CC occur in lower resource countries. The WHO has advocated a comprehensive approach to CC prevention and control. Our research team conducted an intervention project using two universities, the University of Ibadan as control and OAU as the intervention group. We recruited sexually active female undergraduate students into the program. We designed and disseminated an educational program. Students in the intervention group were educated on what CC is, the risk factors, signs and symptoms, as well as prevention strategies. Also, the participants were given the opportunity to have pap smear done. During the intervention, as shown in Figure 7, 47% of the experimental group that had volunteered for the pap smear had abnormal pap smear and required cytology and further investigation. The number of students who volunteered for pap smear could be linked directly with the effect of the educational program. The number of students with abnormal pap smear from the test raised great concern. This supports the advocacy for primary prevention of CC. As a follow-up to our 2013 study, we conducted a survey and identified four major roles of nurses in CC prevention. These are health education, giving of HPV vaccines, CC screening, and involvement in treatment services. The results of our study demonstrated that it is possible to implement a sustainable CC screening in Nigeria using nurse midwives. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the various sources of pain in womanhood is more compounded with reports of mistreatment of the women by the healthcare providers during childbirth. Many interventions have been proposed by international agencies to improve access to healthcare facilities. One of the interventions is respectful maternity care. RMC access to skilled birth attendants. Our team evaluated the impact of a training program on RMC. Our results revealed that there was a slight increase in knowledge and practice of RMC among trained nurse midwives. Still, the clients reported that the RMC received was very poor. Identified barriers to RMC as shown in Table 3, we are lack of women's knowledge on human rights, inadequate staffing, and poor infrastructure. Also, we conducted a scoping literature search that critically analyzed recent health workforce crisis. The Nigeria health system is characterized by a number of health workforce crises due to irregular payments of salaries, poor welfare, lack of appropriate health facilities, emerging factions engage in protracted supremacy challenge, massive brain drain, and security issues. Consequently, these crises have prevented optimal healthcare delivery to the Nigerian population. Aging is another factor that has great influence on womanhood. There are biological changes and new role acquisition dictated by sociocultural factors that could negatively affect the experiences of aging women. Our team discovered that common health conditions suffered by these women were hypertension, neoplasm, cerebrovascular disease, and gastrointestinal diseases. Role changes encountered were widowhood due to loss of spouse, getting poorer because of retirement from active work, and becoming care caregivers to the elderly with chronic diseases. In Yoruba culture, women are the main caregivers at the household level. 
They are believed to stay more with their sick loved ones because of their compassionate nature. Caregivers spend substantial numbers of hours in providing care daily for their sick elderly. Unfortunately, as seen in figure eight, the caregivers that we have studied experience degrees of burden ranging from light to moderate to severe. This burden manifests in the lives of caregivers in various ways, poor health, financial difficulty, disruption of family processes, and social isolation. Nigeria is one of the African countries that lack working policy or provision for older adults. Therefore, the pains of these women are neither recognized nor attended to. As an outcome of our study, we recommended that domiciliary nursing services should be established in Nigeria to provide basic nursing care to homebound individuals. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the toils of early childhood. UNICEF defines a child as anyone below the age of 18 years, while early childhood is defined as the period between birth and eight years. The period of early childhood is marked with rapid growth and high susceptibility to ill health that could sometimes be linked with traditional food taboos, low socioeconomic status of parents, and inaccessibility to health facilities. Our team researched into parental decision making in care of under five children. Results revealed by both fathers and mothers concurred that illness was recognized first by the mothers. But there was evidence that the fathers and mothers may not have been working in partnership. Mothers had taken an action before bringing the children to health facilities. The mother's description of Iba was for malaria, Aragubono peluosi for upper respiratory tract infections, Aragubono pelui beiya for diarrhea diseases. At home level, the mothers had combined the use of orthodox drugs with traditional herbs. The orthodox drugs used were paracetamol, aspirin products, chloroquine, septrine, and cough mixtures. Most of these drugs we are purchased at the patent medicine stores. As shown in figure nine, where there was disagreement on the choice of health facility to use in the care of the child, fathers favored the use of formal health care sector, but mothers preferred the use of informal sector. Urban dwellers, we are better at taking similar decisions than rural dwellers. The results of our studies are very significant for the care of a sick child. Recommendations we are made on the use of educational interventions to enhance spousal communication and fathers and mothers' joint participation in childhood illness management. To reduce the effect of preventable causes of death in the under fives, childhood immunization is a key primary prevention strategy. It is one of the most cost-effective public health interventions. Our research team conducted a study on immunization coverage. Slightly over 26% of the children had been fully immunized, while 64.7% were partially immunized. Vaccination coverage dropped as the child grew older, as shown in figure 10. The vaccines received at birth, BCG and zero polio, had the greatest coverage, while the least received was measles and the HPV, which were received at nine months of age. The poor completion of immunization and drop in immunization as the child grows older are very dangerous trends. There is the tendency of occurrence of re-emerging diseases. We recommended that intervention strategies should target patient education on vaccines, its benefits, and list of centers that give immunization. Motivations should also be given to parents for completion of child's vaccination. One of the most common adverse stimuli experienced by infants is pain. Pain experienced in infants is stored in memory, and they subsequently influence reactions to pain in future. The anatomical, physiological, 
and biochemical prerequisites for pain perception are already present by the 22nd to the 24th week of intrauterine life. Our team investigated mother's knowledge and management of pain using mothers who brought their babies for routine growth monitoring at Well Babies Clinic. The mean age at which pain is experienced by infants, according to majority of the mothers, is two and a half months. They describe pain experienced in infants as distressing. Malaria was the most reported cause of pain. On management strategies, over 50% of mothers use paracetamol, bought at the patent medicine stores, while very few use breastfeeding, cuddling, application of compress, and positioning, i.e. strapping baby on the back. As a follow-up to this, our team used an intervention approach to investigate pain relief strategies in infants receiving DPT-1 immunization. The results as revealed in Table 4, 40% each of infants in breastfeeding and the EMLA, a local anesthetic group, and 25% of control group exhibited mild pain. But 50% of the control infants and none of the breastfeeding group exhibited severe pain. We recommended that parents should be educated at antenatal clinics on pain perception in newborn. Effect of not giving prompt care to infants in pain and use of breastfeeding in relieving pain in infants. EMLA cream should be adopted as a prophylactic strategy at least 60 minutes prior to invasive procedures in infants. While closing up my sessions on maternal and child health, may I request that we rise up and observe a minute silence for all the women and children that have been counted in the global statistics of maternal and child mortality. May we arise to the challenge of reducing the high maternal and child morbidity and mortality in our nation. Thank you, you can say it. The ethos of standardized nursing languages. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the concluding part of my lecture is on the ethos of standardized nursing languages. In 2005, after my PhD program, I was assigned to teach the postgraduate course NSC 603, Advanced Study of the Nursing Process to MSc students. I decided to search the literature for new advances in the nursing process. The concept of nursing intervention classification, NIC, and nursing outcome classification, NOC, came up. Thereafter, I decided for opportunities to learn from the developers of the terminologies. By the grace of God, this led me to my 2009 postdoctoral fellowship program at the College of Nursing, University of Iowa, USA. It was great learning under the mentorship of Dr. Sue Moorhead and the Nick and Nock teams. As the first African nurse on the team, I contributed to the seventh edition of NIC and the fifth edition of the NOC textbooks. <laughs> Returning home, my department at OAU gave full support to organize the Neander International African Chapter, now known as Association of Standardized Nursing Languages in Nigeria. These concepts of NIC and NOC have been introduced into my teaching of MSc students. In 2010, it was introduced nationally at the first biennial conference of the Nyanda African Network in conjunction with the College of Nursing, University of Iowa, and the Nyanda International, a hybrid conference with our international partners. 
journey through the virtual window ahead of COVID-19 era held in this university. To intensify the introduction of the concept, by annual conferences we are held in 2012 in this university, at the University of Ibadan in 2014, at the Women's International Center in Abuja in 2016, in 2018 at the University of Calabar, Lagos would have been the venue for 2020 but for the COVID-19 lockdown. Working with a team, training workshops we are held in UCH Ibadan, University of Ilori Teaching Hospital Ilori, Ogun State University Shagamu, University of Abuja Teaching Hospital Abuja, Lagos State University Teaching Hospital Lassut, OETH Ileife, at MCPDP programs in Ekiti and Oshu State, and for the nursing corps of the Nigerian Air Force, Kaduna 2020. The standardized nursing languages are the pathway for making the nursing process usable and visible. There are content standards that include terms which represent a focus on diagnosis, interventions, and outcomes that are consistent with the scope of nursing practice. When the terminologies for diagnosis, outcome, and intervention are used to develop a predetermined intervention for a particular patient group or nursing diagnosis, it becomes a standardized nursing care plan, SNCP. The SNCP is a clinical guideline that is used in practice. It enables optimal information exchange and meaningful use of data in research and program evaluation. Currently, SNCPs are the only way that nursing care plans can be incorporated into the electronic health system. Our team started research in this area by using a client study to demonstrate the use of SNLs in a clinical setting. Lessons learned were that when these concepts are applied while caring for a client, documentation was presented in a better form. As part of a needs assessment, our team assessed nursing process booklets from OETH Ileife. About 87% of the booklets had a total of 154 nursing diagnosis NDs. 60% of the NDs were made within the first 48 hours, as shown in figure 11. The most frequently used NDs were acute pain in surgical and orthopedic wards, anxiety in medical wards, and self-care deficit in mental health wards. According to Hedman and Kamitsuri 2017, a nursing diagnosis is defined as a professional judgment that is based on the application of clinical knowledge which determines potential or actual experiences and responses to health problems and life processes or a vulnerability to such response from an individual, family, group, or community. Studies on ND validation are essential sources in searching for evidence and in the reduction of the probability of errors in the nurse's diagnostic process and decision-making process. Working with my postgraduate students, we have validated three nursing diagnoses, namely acute pain, impaired mood regulation, and ineffective infant feeding pattern. Our team introduced for the first time into the country paper-based SNCPs, as shown in plate one. <laughs> Through a quasi-experimental study using public health nurses in Ogun State's primary health care centers, during the pre-intervention phase of this work, a neat assessment was done. It was discovered that the public health nurses documented the care given to their clients in small booklets using medical diagnoses Based on identified common health problems, appropriate NDs we are selected. The NDs we are used to develop paper form SNCPs. A five-day training workshop was held with the PHNs in the intervention group. The SNCPs were introduced to the PHNs. 
and their use was monitored on a monthly basis. And at the end of 12 weeks, the first post-test was conducted. And a second post-test was done at the end of 12 months post-intervention. Results revealed that at post-test, the PHNs in the experimental group were able to identify appropriate NDs. They identified NIC activities that were specific to solving client problems and linked indicators of NOC which were related to the identified diagnosis and interventions. This was the humble beginning of introducing SNCPs into the country. As a follow-up, our team developed and introduced electronic nursing records, tagged Stenicare, plate two. At the University, <laughs> at the University of Illinois Teaching Hospital, during the study, paper-based SNCPs and SNCPs incorporated into the electronic health records were introduced into selected wards. Nurses in selected wards were given a planned educational program. The results revealed that many of the nurses were computer literate. There was an improvement in documentation quality in the selected wards. After introducing SNCPs, there were higher quality scores in the electronic ward post-intervention. The SNL's educational intervention improved nurses' assessment and documentation skills. The SNCPs provided nurses with a guide to be used to enhance care planning and documentation. Furthermore, we conducted evaluation studies in the three teaching hospitals that have benefited from our work on SNLs and SNCPs from 2015 to 2019. These hospitals were OATH Ilefe, UCH Ibado, and UITH Ilori. Results revealed that there was moderate utilization of SNLs in nurses' documentation of care. Over the five-year periods, there were fluctuations in the overall quality of documentation, as shown in Figure 12. The qualitative results revealed that the, the nurses' documentation was done manually, thus posing storage problems. Lack of mandate from educational system Inadequate staffing and no motivation were major challenges to the use of SNLs in clinical practice. It is noteworthy to indicate that based on this humble beginning, some universities have incorporated SNLs into their nursing research activities. In recognition of my work in this area, I received the Outstanding Service Award from the Nyanda African Network. <laughs> Sustaining the continuation of this work has been a challenge. There is need for support from nurses at all levels and from the management of hospitals and health facilities. In order to enhance nurses' access to the SNCPs, our team is producing a book titled Standardized Nursing Care Plan, a quality guide to nursing practice. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my contribution to teaching. Sir, I have spent most of my life in the nursing education setting. Therefore, I've had the great opportunity of relating with students from 1983 till date from the diploma to the PhD level. Over the years, I have successfully supervised 25 MSc and five PhD students <laughs> who finished their program at record time. <laughs> Two of my doctoral students benefited from the Carter Fellowship. Subsequently, I received awards for the early completion of these doctoral students from Qatar. I have contributed to four textbooks and have published over 50 journal articles. Based on my experiences with pains of womanhood, I have emphasized to every group of students that I have taught 
and at every opportunity of giving induction lectures, these words. So the girls, love is not blind. It has two eyes. Shine your eyes before you choose a husband. Do not marry an abuser. So the boys, so the boys, care for every woman, including your wife. And to all, do not have more than two children that you can care for properly. <laughs> Contribution to the university and professional development. Obafemi Awolo University has been a grooming and nurturing ground for me. I joined this university as a lecturer too in October 1995 and rose to the rank of a professor in October 2013. <laughs> At the department, I've had the opportunity of serving as the postgraduate coordinator, coordinator for the distance learning program and as acting head of department. Outside the university, I have served on the board of the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria from 2013 to 2015. During that period, I chaired the Education Committee and the Research Publication Committees. I worked with the teams to develop reforms in nursing education in Nigeria and in producing the Council's journal. In 2019 to 2021, I was privileged to serve on an ad hoc committee of the Nursing and Midwifery Council that developed clinical-based masters in nursing curricula for the nation. On international level, I served as Africa's regional representative on the Nurse Advisory Board of the 2010 International Year of the Nurse and as coordinator for the Nigeria Ghana Network Group of Nyanda International from 2009 to 2018. <laughs> By the grace of God, since November 1995 till date, I've had the opportunity to serve as an advisor to the Baptist Student Fellowship of this university. The missions group has demonstrated great strides in combining their academic work with community outreaches where they preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, work with the communities to upgrade their lives through teaching and provision of health care. They have been involved with over 28 villages. This brought me into a relationship with the Nigerian Baptist Convention and generations of students. Many of the students are graduates and are living productively all over the world. I was also instrumental to starting the BNSE program of the Bowen University in Rome. <laughs> Currently, I'm serving on the Bowen University Teaching Hospital Board and work directly with the Medical Board of the Nigerian Baptist Convention in writing programs related to health matters. Contributions to the community, the widows group. I was introduced to a widows group that meant monthly at the First Baptist Church in Lare. This group is an outreach venture of the Love Fellowship. The fellowship was started by Professor L. O. Kende. We supported widows from very poor background who we are struggling with meddling relatives, in-laws, and growing children, thus adding to their pains. We held Christian fellowship with them and paid occasional visits to them at home to understand their situations. The Love Fellowship got funders who sponsored the tuition fees and one school meal for the widow's children at a private Christian school. Funders also sent money to set up businesses for these women. We have success stories of some of these children becoming graduates, starting families, and making positive progress in their lives. Some are still struggling. We rejoice at the successes, but empathize with the struggling ones. My experience with this group influenced my life, especially my parenting style. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my recommendations. 
I propose a health sociological approach to the training of nurse midwives and provision of care for the populace, particularly women and children. Health sociology emphasizes on health goals that are bound with the prevention of people from diseases and promoting their well-being and reducing mortality and morbidity in populations. Two, there must be intensified mobilization and empowering of the community and individuals of all age groups. This will empower the girls and the women to exercise their rights and ownership of their bodies. Three, the current strife amongst health workers should be appraised and addressed. Effective and sincere dialogue should be used to settle differences. Prolonged strike actions prevent people from utilizing health facilities, even when they have the knowledge and will to make a choice. Nigerians, particularly women and children, are suffering. And lastly, Universities and clinical facilities should form collaborations on the research and integration of SNLs and SNCPs into nursing practice. This will facilitate quality nursing care to clients and Nigeria's contribution to global knowledge development in nursing. In conclusion, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I started my discourse today with an anecdote. The anecdote is the story of my humble beginning. My mother, as shown in picture 16, whom I then called Antimi, delivered me all by herself in the early hours of 11th April 1956 without the assistance of a skilled bath attendant. Did she even receive antenatal care? Coincidentally, April 11th has been declared as the International Day for Maternal Health and Rights. What a great coincidence. The same woman became one of the statistics of maternal mortality 12 years later when she died in another midnight at a maternity hospital with complications of pregnancy. I salute her gallantry. At the face of death, her last words to me were nearby Feo Lubalaki Yosinko. By the love of God our Savior, all will be well. Could her life have been the driving force? For my unconscious passion for the reduction of maternal and child mortality and morbidity and the title of this lecture, my daily prayer and focus are raising a generation of nurse midwives and other workers who will join in this warfare to achieve the SDG 2030 agenda as listed on the slide. My appreciation. Sir, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, as I wrap up my lecture, I express my appreciation to persons and establishments that have supported me. I appreciate my teachers, starting from my grandmother, Mama Bernice Ariola Onowola, who introduced me to early secular and spiritual education, and to those at the formal institutions, which lists are listed on the slide. I acknowledge my students. My students, I appreciate them. Reflecting on what they have done, they spurred me to knowledge and they, they led me to be into new knowledge. They are my source of joy and hope that my labor has not been, in, 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 and won't be wasted. I became a security name that clocked one of them to work every day in the United States. I became a face to many that flout my name as their supervisor and teacher all over the world. I sincerely thank my colleagues at various schools of nursing and departments of nursing, OAU, University of Ghana, University of Iowa, and University of Joss and Bowen University. Working as a team could be challenging and stressful. We have had days of not understanding each other, but the outcome has been phenomenal. I appreciate all the international and local agencies that funded my researches and international travels, as listed on the slide. I express appreciation to this great university, OU Lefe, for providing me with the academic and professional growth. So the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria, I, I want to thank them for giving me the opportunity to contribute to policy and development of nursing at national level. So the Nigerian Baptist Convention, Bowen University Iwo, and the Boots Teaching Hospital, I say thank you for providing me with the opportunity to, to express my faith and values in my professional practice. 
I want to deeply appreciate all the health facilities represented here, UCH, UITH, the people from Ilori, you provided us with the premise to carry out researches. I appreciate deeply the staff and the clients that we use for our projects. Their support contributed significantly to our work. So God be the glory for a wonderful family. I appreciate the Onawela's family, the Olaogun's family, my extended families, the Akorodas, Fashuans, Olaleyes, our bosom friends, the Olamis, Oluyemis, and Shonayas. To my children, all of them seated here, my grandchildren, and lastly to my husband for driving me into academics and allowing my week to fly. And finally, to Almighty God, my Father and Creator, who destined my path in life, to you be all the glory, honor, praise, and adoration. Thank you all for listening, and God bless.